And our first speaker today is Dr. Paul Curtis, who is an extension wildlife specialist in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell. Um, his work has focused on reducing human wildlife conflicts in agriculture and suburban landscapes. And he's really an amazing uh, resource for wildlife damage management professionals, as well as the public. We're really happy to have Paul and uh, very worried about his pending retirement. Um, but today, Dr. Curtis will be talking about repellents, fencing, and other IPM approaches for managing deer. So, Paul, the stage is yours. Thanks, Matt, and welcome, everyone. I'd like to go through and just talk about the basics of deer management. I could easily spend an hour on this, but we've only got a limited amount of time, so I'm going to dive right in. Lots of issues with deer in suburban areas. Uh, deer vehicle accidents, by far, are probably the most uh, significant economic impact. We hit 70, 80,000 deer a year on New York Highway. Crop damage, we did a survey of deer damage to agriculture almost two, two decades ago now, and at that time, they cost about $59 million a year in crop losses. But I'm gonna focus on the days in this upper right photo. Uh, landscape issues, deer browsing, uh, particularly the woody ornamentals, perennials, other plants, forest regeneration failures, uh, as this lower right picture, is also a significant problem across New York uh, and uh, tick-borne diseases, but we're going to focus on just the landscape issue today. Uh, we're, when you talk about wildlife damage management, I always like to approach it from an IPM standpoint. And what we're trying to do is figure out the best combination of techniques in any given situation that's going to solve the problem in the most cost effective way. And so usually with deer and other wildlife, uh, we're looking at some combination of population management, fencing, repellents, and plant selection, and we'll go over each of these. Some general rules of thumb for reducing plant damage in home landscapes. Repellents can work, but they tend to work best when the deer pressure damage is in the, the light to moderate range. Deer aren't in the landscape every day. Uh, when you get uh, a situation where a home, uh, for example, near a woody area, on, right on a deer travel lane, deer in the landscape every day, uh, probably fencing is going to provide the only reliable control. Try to encourage communities and landowners to manage herd density when it's possible. We know each adult deer eats six to eight pounds of forage a day. And when that's the sensitive tips of uh, your woody ornamentals or your prized uh, perennial flowers, that's a, that can be a lot of plants. You can choose plants that are less attractive to deer. We'll go over some uh, plant list in a little bit. And I want to emphasize uh, deer feeding is illegal in New York State. If you're feeding deer within 300 feet of a public highway and your neighbor reports you, an ECO could write a ticket for that. Deer population reduction, by far and away, uh, most deer are removed in New York State through recreational hunting, uh, usually uh, between uh, the buck and doe harvest it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 240 to 280,000 deer a year. Uh, they're Special permits that DEC offers landowner, uh, for example, if you're a, a forest or an ag landowner or have, uh, a little more acreage in the typical suburban property, you can get DMAP, Deer Management Assisted Program tags for taking additional antlerless deer, give those to hunters using your property. Uh, in more urban areas, such like parks and preserves, where deer browsing is over abundance, DEC will sometimes issue DMPs or uh, what some folks refer to them as nuisance deer permits. And these allow take of deer outside the hunting season, permits all sorts of things, such as taking deer at night with over bait with lighted uh, equipment. And then there's LCPs, or those are research permits most folks aren't going to be involved with. From the exclusion standpoint, if you've really got to keep deer out of an area, uh, eight foot high uh, fencing is, is the sort of the minimum height. Uh, deer would have a very difficult time getting over an eight foot fence. Uh, the picture on the lower left, this was my home garden when I lived in Ellis Hollow in the Ithaca area. I was one of the last folks to, to garden because our deer densities were so high and they would just eat about everything to the ground. You don't have to fence an entire area. You can do individual plant protection. Uh, this photo here in the upper right is the uh, Cornell University Arboretum. 
uh, our breeding staff spend about twenty thousand dollars a year on, on deer protection, doing individual plant uh, protection with these uh, netted cages, doing repellent work, and other types of things to reduce deer impacts to the plant collection. And for home gardens, small uh, garden plots or uh, uh, perennial beds, uh, electric fences can work quite well too. Lots of repellents. This is uh, the typical shelf in uh, the local farm supply store. I took this picture in Ithaca Eggway, and you can just see the myriad of products that are available out there. It's really buyer beware. Most of these things have never really been tested under field settings, under replicated experimental trials, but we've done some repellent tests over the year, and I'd like to share our results. Active ingredient is really important. Over the years, my experience has been uh, products that contain either uh, putrescent egg so solids, rotten eggs, or capsaicin as primary active ingredients tend to, tend to work the best. The way we test repellents, we use uh, use as our model. Uh, use are like candy for deer during the winter months. They seek them out in the landscape. And then we treat use with different repellent products, uh, take digital photos of those on a weekly basis. And this is one of our control plants after two weeks in the field. And you can see about 50% of the surface area that has been removed by deer. And so it makes a, a very good rigorous test of repellents. And we do it in winter because that's when the deer fat reserves are the lowest and the deer are the hungriest. So it gives me a really good idea how well the repellents can work. What we found over the years, uh, this was a trial we did many years ago, but uh, the results are still valid. Uh, products that, again, tend to have rotten egg, putrescent egg solids is the active ingredient. Uh, those cluster here on this top line. We saw no deer damage through four weeks of a trial during winter. Things like deer stopper two, big game repellent, mix and spray, all contain uh, putrescent egg solids as the primary active ingredient. But even those best products, after about six weeks start to fail, and by the time you're eight weeks out, uh, they're really not performing as well as you'd like. Uh, they've lost their effectiveness. And so what this shows is that when deer are hungry, even the best repellents that are available tend to last about four to six weeks, and then you got to reapply. That's fine if you live in a, a, on a warmer area, maybe down in lower Hudson Valley, Long Island, where you might get away with the spray in December or January. But a lot of the upstate region, uh, you know, from Ithaca northward, uh, we've often got ice and snow on the ground by January, February, and March, and you're not going to be able to spray. So if you did get a spray in December, uh, by January, that material is fading pr pretty quickly, and it's essentially gone by February. So that's why I recommend uh, fencing for reliable uh, deer protection of woody ornamentals. We did test a new product in 1920, 21, Trico Pro. Uh, it's, I got material out of Austria. It's registered in New York State now. Uh, we able, were able to provide uh, data for registration. And this uh, repellent actually has performed better than others I've tested. Uh, we set up replicate plots of uh, control use, treated some with the trico, and treated some with plant skid, which is a, a common commercial deer repellent that's got pretty good reviews over the year. Uh, just for comparison's sake, we wanted to see how well trico will hold up compared to plant skid. So we had four sites in the Rochester area, 24 U's at each site. So, uh, uh, so we replicated that. Here's a video uh, at one of our sites, uh, uh, Pine Grove Ave, adult doe with two fawns coming in, and you can see how deer just love to, to browse uh, use. This was the site that had our highest uh, deer pressure that gives you an example how quickly just a handful of deer can do significant damage to woody ornamentals. We scored each taxis uh, in spring and early April. Uh, we did a spring in November, a single spray. Uh, again, to see how long the material would last. Uh, we gave plants a score of zero if there were no damage, uh, a one if the damage was less than 10%. And we're starting to see about 20% or so of the plant disappearing, got a two. Uh, you get up to 40, 50% or more disappearing, a three, uh, uh, like 60 to 80% of four, and over 80% of the plant gone a score of five. So this will give you an idea how to interpret this next graph. I'm going to show you. So here's our four study sites. Uh, we had um, Birch Hill Drive, and at Birch Hill Drive, A is Trico, 
and here's the damage score on the y-axis. Uh, and so the ewes that were treated with plant skid and our controls were both completely decimated at Birch Hill Drive. All the trees had a score of five. At Fairfield Crescent, uh, the deer browsing pressure was a little bit lighter than Birch Hill. All the control plants had scores of five. Plant skid was moderately effective. Uh, we started to see some scores in the ones to two, uh, but we had no browsing on any of the trico treated tree. Pine Grove Ave, where I showed you the video, that was the site the deer were in the property every night. And uh, the trico was the last product to fail, but it eventually failed by uh, early to mid February. And so by the time we got to April, all the plants had a score of five. In St. Paul Boulevard, that was our site with the lightest deer pressure. Our control plants got heavily damaged, but both trico and plant skid both protected the ewes. So take home messages are there's no deer repellent that's 100% effective under all conditions that's going to last with a single spray from November through spring green up. But the, the trico pro really actually perform quite well, better than I expected, and at least as good as anything else that's commercially available that I tested. Well, I'll talk a bit about deer feeding behavior, because as you can see from our last graph, uh, deer feeding pressure varies site to site. And so it makes it really difficult to predict what plants are going to be browsed and what plants aren't going to be browsed, because there's so many things that influence deer feeding pressure. One, what's the local population density. Do you have 50 deer per square mile, 100 deer per square mile, 150 deer per square mile, like we see in spots on eastern Long Island? What are the food and cover sources for the deer? What are the travel corridors? If you're in a property that's on a travel corridor like that Pine Grove Ave site, uh, the deer are in it every day, uh, you're probably the only thing that's going to work to protect your plant material is going to be fencing. What are alternative foods? What season and weather? The reason we test uh, repellents in winter, that's when the deer fat reserves are the lowest, that's when they're the hungriest. And so if you get a, a really tough New York winter where there's snow on the ground from late November to April by February, those deer are really hungry and they'll eat things they otherwise wouldn't take. Plant palatability and nutrients, previous experience also influences feeding pressure. Uh, I'll sh show you some plant lists, the things that tend to be more deer resistant than other in just a moment. We know deer seek out nitrogen in the landscape, so if you heavily fertilize your plants, uh, they're going to be more attractive to deer. These are the, the short list of woody ornamentals that are, I would consider rarely damaged by deer. These are starvation foods. It doesn't mean deer will never eat Colorado blue spruce or American holly, but if they're eating those things in the landscape, uh, those deer are very hungry and there's not much else out there. So if you can uh, landscape with these type of, of plant materials, then you're probably in the typical homeowner setting, not going to need to protect them from deer. Uh, they're relatively deer resistant. On the other end of the spectrum are things that uh, are frequently severely damaged by deer. Of the Christmas trees, the balsam and the Fraser fir, are the ones that are first taken first and can be heavily browsed. Uh, things like your fruit trees, your apples, cherries, plums, deer seek out. Rhododendrons and azaleas, things that have nice fleshy uh, buds uh, during the winter months, things that are evergreen, uh, cedar, yews, American Arbor Vitae, those soft evergreen type uh, foliage uh, deer seek out in the landscape. So if you've got these type of plant materials, even at relatively low deer densities and not necessarily a tough winter, uh, they're probably going to require some type of protection. We also did a trial uh, with perennial bulbs and uh, looking at what perennial bulbs were deer resistant and which weren't. And uh, uh, Bill Miller collaborated with me several years ago. We used tulips sort of as a control because we know deer love tulips. And then we did a variety of other bulbs. There were over 30 varieties of bulbs in the trial. And we put them out cafeteria style in these pots, raised to plants in the greenhouse, put them out in homeowner backyards with high deer density and let deer walk up and down the pots and pick and choose what they wanted to eat. What we found was no big surprise that uh, plants that got the highest damage score were tulips, uh, uh, but also crocuses were heavily damaged in, in this trial. The only other perennial bulb that really had a fairly significant impact was uh, genus nine, Canadoxa, uh, 
bulbs were heavily impacted. But most of the other uh, perennial bulbs are pretty darn deer resistant. You can plant hyacinths, daffodils, irises, alliums, a whole lot of these other common uh, perennial bulbs and don't have to worry about deer protection. They've got secondary compounds and things that make them uh, herbivore resistant. Uh, I'm going to wrap up here and save just a couple minutes for questions. I do want to share uh, a couple of websites. If you go to this uh, wildlife control info website, that's my extension site. There's fact sheets on deer and a whole host of other uh, wildlife uh, uh, pests that you can find in home landscape. Uh, PDF files are available there to download free of charge. And if you want uh, more of an in-depth dive in this, we have a book available for sale uh, for homeowners managing wildlife damage practical methods and that's at our wildlifecontroltraining.com website so with that Matt I'll open it up for uh, questions from folks and I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see people great thanks Paul um, as always chock full of of great information and especially um, I like your mention of you know what active ingredients are effective on the products on shelf, because that's what we see for a lot of uh, tech products as well. There's just a whole selection and it's hard to know, you know, what, which ones are going to work. So thanks for pointing out which ingredients are going to be the most effective. Um, the first question that we had was, do the electric fences need to be eight feet high as well? Um, and then any other guidance for using um, electric fencing for home setting that you can provide? No, the, the electric fences do not need to be eight foot high. You know, generally what I do, I use electric fencing on smaller planting beds or small home gardens, you know, maybe uh, a space that's 20 yards by 30 or 40 yards in size, just to stay uh, a typical planting bed size. And we use a single strand of electric poly tape or poly wire 30 inches above ground at deer nose height. Uh, you want to have a good high powered fence charger because a deer hits the wire with its fur, uh, particularly uh, during the colder months when they're better insulated, they don't get much of a shock. And the electric fencing can be the effectiveness is increased by uh, putting uh, cloth strips on it and spraying those cloth strips with a uh, egg-based deer repellent, so they get the double negative of the odor plus the electric shock if they, if they touch the fence. And uh, that can work very well for protecting uh, small areas uh, during the growing season. Electric fences are, are not going to work during the winter months. So if you've got to protect woody ornamentals over winter, you're going to need a barrier fence. But for growing season, for perennial beds, home gardens, electric fencing can be work quite well and be relatively inexpensive. Great. Um, the next question was, do deer eat grapes um, or would that be something that squirrels are are doing on someone's property? Uh, I know in the wild deer eat grapes, so I suspect they'll take them out of a, a vineyard or homeowner setting. Squirrels also eat grapes, so you could have multiple wildlife species. Foxes will take grapes. Foxes love grapes. And so it could be a number of different critters. Raccoons love grapes. And so, again, it could be many species. About the only way to know the damage is occurring at night it would be to set up something like a trail camera that's working 24 hours a day to actually figure out what the species are. But several wildlife like species would take grapes. And then the last, oh, um, the next question that came in was any tips for keeping deer away from bird feeders? Uh, probably the best thing is if you can put just a some type of a barrier fence around it so they just can't walk up to it, knock it over, or reach in and grab the seed. And it doesn't have to be big. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be that high. I would say uh, three to four feet high is plenty big enough, and you could just uh, put it on a couple of wooden stakes, wrap it around just so that just enough of a barrier so the deer can't reach in and steal the food out of the feeder, bump the feeder and knock it over and still allow you to get in to add seed when the, when the feeder is empty. Uh, someone asking about where uh, can you buy the Trico Pro in the U.S.? Uh, there's a couple of different distributors. I can send you that info, Matt. Uh, probably it's available online, but I, I'd have to check my file. To, I think Tom Fox is the distributor for the Northeast, but I can get you that info, Matt. You can share with the group. Okay, great. Um, besides the rotten egg as an active ingredient, were there others um, 
you know, for people that are still on the call that might have missed it, were there other active ingredients that are really effective? Uh, capsaicin, the active ingredient of hot pepper, that's in a, a product called Miller's Hot Sauce. That's worked really well for both deer and elk, uh, but it's a little bit of a nuisance to apply because you don't want to get capsaicin in your mucous membranes uh, or on your hands or around your eyes. So you definitely want to wear PPE when you're applying it so that you don't get any of the any of the spray uh, in your own mucous membrane because it will burn. But that's that's performed well. Uh, we've had decent protection sometimes with thyrum. Thyrum is a fungicide. There are a couple of repellents that contain thyrum as the active ingredient. It's a decent deer repellent. Uh, under moderate pressures. And the last question that we'll ask is, um, what do you think about using burlap wrap um, on cedar hedge? And then uh, the other part of the question was about using Irish spring soap. And I have a comment, but Paul might have a comment on that as well. Okay. Well, uh, Irish spring soap is a home remedy. We know soap has some deer repellent properties. Uh, if you look at the uh, commercial product hinder, the active ingredient is uh, ammonium soaps. Uh, we do know from trials in the past that soaps that have a tallow base uh, are the ones that repel deer. It's the tallow in the soap that they're trying to avoid. If you take a soap like pumice that doesn't have a tallow base, a more abrasive soap, deer don't pay any attention to it. So again, uh, the reason that the trico works, the active ingredient is sheep fat. And so it's the fat base that's somehow deer really don't like that, that fat. And that's the fats that are in the soap base that they don't like. But Irish spring soap would be a home remedy. Typically, we don't recommend that with an extension, but you can go out and uh, buy hinder and you'll have the same active ingredient. It's much easier to spray and apply. Great. That's what I was hoping you'd mention, Paul, about the uh, home remedies that we can't really recommend. So, um, well, thanks, Paul. As always, we really appreciate your time and expertise. Um, at this point, we will transition to our next segment, which is the IPM Minute. Um, and this takes a quick look at a timely topic and provides some action items you can take um, this weekend, for example. And uh, for our IPM Minute today, I'd like to introduce my co-host on this program, Dr. Amara Dunn. Um, she is the biocontrol specialist at the New York State IPM program. And today she's going to be talking to us about where you chuck your pumpkins matters. So take it away, Amara. Thanks, Matt. You may all be wondering what pumpkin disposal has to do with integrated pest management. And I'm glad you asked that question because that's what we are going to talk about today. Um, I will also acknowledge that, you know, some folks may be getting rid of their pumpkins. Some folks may wanna hang on to their fall decorations a little bit longer. Whenever you are disposing of your pumpkins, we're gonna talk about um, what you should consider when doing that. I do want to start by clarifying that the vast majority of pumpkins should absolutely be composted. Composting your pumpkins is a great IPM strategy. You're keeping waste out of the landfill and you are turning your waste pumpkins into something that can be used to fertilize your garden, which is wonderful. I want to talk about just a very small exception and a caution to keep in the back of your mind today, and that is a plant disease called Phytophthora blight. And this word phytophthora um, really means at its root plant destroyer. And this is a disease that destroys a lot of plants. It's caused by a water mold called phytophthora capsaicae. In addition to killing pumpkins, it kills all other cucurbits. So that's going to be your winter squashes, summer squashes, cucumbers, melons, also peppers. And I've got a picture of a pepper here that's kind of shriveled up, not something you'd want to eat. Tomatoes, here are some tomatoes here. They've got brown spots on them and looks like they've been sprinkled with powdered sugar, not something that's going to be tasty, as well as eggplants. Here's an eggplant that will not make good eggplant Parmesan. And beans, you can see there are some, um, they were green snap beans. They're starting to get shriveled up and not looking very tasty. The other problem with the water mold that causes phytophthora blight is that it survives the winter with no problem here in New York State, and that includes surviving in compost piles. Which brings us to the caveat of how you dispose of your pumpkin. If your pumpkin has phytophthora blight, you definitely do not want to put it in your compost pile, because what you're doing is you are putting um, a plant pathogen into your compost pile. 
it will survive just fine in there. And when you use that compost on your garden, you're inoculating your whole garden with this pathogen that can cause disease on really a wide range of vegetables that you might want to be growing in your garden. So you might be wondering, how do I know if my pumpkin has Phytophthora blight? I am going to tell you. Um, there are a lot of other molds and rots on pumpkins that are pretty normal, especially after you've carved them. So in this picture on the right, this pumpkin was carved. Um, it's starting to decompose. It's getting buried by leaves. There's some black on it. Phytophthora blight does not look black. Also, Phytophthora blight does not look fluffy or fuzzy. If the rot on your pumpkin is three-dimensional, probably not Phytophthora blight. Phytophthora blight is not green. So if you see a green mold on your pumpkin, probably not Phytophthora blight. Here are some pictures of what Phytophthora blight does look like. The classic symptom is it looks like your pumpkin has been sprinkled with powdered sugar. And that powdered sugar may be evenly distributed on the pumpkin, like you can see in this middle picture here, or it might be in rings. That's because what looks like powdered sugar is actually millions of spores that are re re uh, produced in response to the day-night light cycles. There might be some other colors on the pumpkin that has Phytophthora blight too. This is just a secondary fungus that's turning this pumpkin black, but this white powdered sugar appearance is what you're looking for. You might also notice something that's uh, referred to as a water-soaked lesion or leading edge. So you can see on this pumpkin here, there's kind of a line. And on this one, there's a line between a darker area and a lighter area. Imagine if you dipped an orange towel in water, the part that got wet would look darker and water soaked. That's where the name comes from. So if you think your, your pumpkin has Phytophthora blight, please put it in the trash. Do not put it in your compost pile. Probably though your pumpkin is fine, in which case we hope that you will recycle it in your compost pile. I will also mention that when you are looking for pumpkins a little bit earlier in the fall, you might just want to check them out. If it looks like it's got powdered sugar on it when you're picking it out, just leave it at the stand, pick out a different pumpkin. So thank you for your time today. Um, Matt put in the chat and link where you can learn some more about Phytophthora blight and hope you have a good rest of your day. Great. Thank you, Amara. Um... A lot for us to think about this weekend and then, of course, into the future as we're selecting our pumpkins and how we're going to dispose of our pumpkins. So thank you for that great presentation and thank you all for attending today. We hope to see you at a future First Friday event um, and we um, hope you have a wonderful weekend. So thank you.